Hong Kong's Iron Lady knows how to fight for freedom. For decades, Emily Lau has been on the front lines of the battle for Hong Kong. Welcome to China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. Joining me now is a woman who was a household name in Hong Kong, Emily Lau. She's been a journalist, a politician, and a major thorn in Beijing's side. Perfect for China Uncensored. Emily, thank you for joining me. Hi. So in 1996, you and other legislators uh, laid down in a major road to protest how Hong Kong's chief executive would be selected. So you're basically the first Umbrella Movement protester. <laughs> I, I guess you're right. And if you tell those kids out there, they would say, oh, what, really? Because that was before they were born. Mm -hmm. And that's true. And then, of course, I get a very bad nickname for that. And, but that's true. What I mean, was the nickname? Well, it's, in Chinese, it's, it's fun guy hang. That means someone lying in the street. And wow. actually, I run into a court, a high court judge mm -hmm. uh, a few months later. And he said, Emily. Haven't you got a bed to lie on? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. So what do you think of the tactics and strategies uh, protesters have been using in the Umbrella Movement and the current extradition bills? Well, the Umbrella Movement started out as the Occupation Movement. Mm -hmm. And we have the Occupy Trio. Benny Tai, Chen Kim Man, and Reverend Chu. And my party, the Democratic Party, was the first to come out to support them. Mm -hmm. Because they say, well, we have been fighting for democracy for so long and get nowhere. Maybe we should use civil disobedience mm -hmm. to fight. Occupy Central with peace and love. No violence, no disorder. So my party said, OK, well, let's have a go. So we supported it. But then when it did happen two years later, which of course got very, everybody very impatient, and, uh, and then we have this, the students rushing into the government complex. They were arrested and the people got very excited. They want to come and save the students. So the whole movement changed from a peace and loving occupation to something that we want to rescue the students. And Are you then, talking about now or during the Umbrella Movement? The Umbrella Movement. Okay. Yeah, that's what, you know, it, hap it, it was uh, the initiated like that. Mm -hmm. Because of the students climbing into a government complex and were arrested, it changed. Mm -hmm. And then the, the Occupy Trio were in a bind because they wanted to do it on October 1st mm -hmm. outside the Mandarin Hotel. Actually, they wanted to do it for two days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they had already briefed the police. They said, we will have hundreds, maybe a thousand people lying down the street and will be arrested and it should be over in one or two days. But because of the student and all that, many people rushed into Admiralty, mm -hmm. outside the Legislative Council complex and the Which government right offices there. there. And, and, and the trio were forced to say, oh, don't wait for October 1st. Forget about your plan. Let's do it now. The students just took the reins. Well, not the students. And, and they, were, they felt quite difficult because some people would say, go ahead. Mm -hmm. And then the students say, don't go ahead. Mm -hmm. Don't you hijack our movement. Mm -hmm. So there was already some argument then. But and in the end, they decided to, to call it there yeah. instead of coming to the Mandarin Hotel. But, and then many people came. Mm. It was very peaceful and it was amazing. And many people who came, foreign journalists, where did they come from? They come from Syria, they come from Yemen, Venezuela, Iraq, where there is carnage and slaughter every day. Mm. But here, we have hundreds of thousands of people occupying the main thoroughfare, but doing homework, doing waste separation, so peaceful. That's why it's news. <laughs> Otherwise, if there's carnage, <laughs> you cannot be more violent than Syria. Mm -hmm. So it was very good. But of course, the government would not relent. We were asking for democratic elections. Mm -hmm. And Beijing said no. So the government here, of course, said no. And in the end, it dragged on for 79 days. In fact, the Occupy Trio pulled out earlier mm -hmm. because they said, well, that's it. They're not going to clear us up. And, and the people do not want us to continue, let's go home. But the young people did not want to go. So we dra dragged on for 79 days and finally they came to Admiralty to arrest us one by one. 
And still, I have not yet been charged, but they still can charge me mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, what is it, uh, uh, taking part in illegal assembly. Public nuisance. I think or whatever, yeah. Charge. And if they charge me with that, I would say, yes, guilty. That's civil disobedience, mm -hmm. but they haven't charged me. Just like back in uh, 1996, mm -hmm. they did not charge me. <laughs> you do seem like a public nuisance, like a very dangerous figure. Is that right? That's right. <laughs> So maybe you should have, in your 96 protests, stayed on the streets for 79 days. How well, long were you out there for? Well, we were there for maybe one hour. You gave up too soon. Yeah, well, no. Actually, what, you know what happened was the police people were, the road was closed. Mm -hmm. And they were calling up Chris Patton, who was the last governor. Hey, Gov, <laughs> Emily Lau and the others are lying on the street. Actually, we were not blocking anything because mm -hmm. they were having the farce inside called election. Mm. And we were just lying down. So they picked us up one by one and took us back to the Wan Chai police station. And then they, sitting in there, I got a call from the BBC. So the, the police allowed me to go out and, and uh, I dial a collect call to the BBC. I said, Emily Lau calling you. Oh, Emily, good. We are about to go on air. Hang on, let's put you on. Top of the news. Today in Hong Kong, they elected the first chief executive of the future Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Outside the convention center, there were demonstrations and the demonstrators were arrested. One of them is legislator Emily Lau. Emily, where are you? I said, I'm in the Wan Chai police station. Oh, have they beaten you up? I said, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Was that a risk? <laughs> no risk. Now, that's the thing about Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Even from then up to now, Hong Kong is one of the safest mm -hmm. and most peaceful city in the world. Definitely in China, but in the world. Yeah. So they say, oh, we have to pass this extradition bill. If not, uh, uh, we will become a haven for fugitives. I said, we've been negotiating with, chi with China for 20 years mm -hmm. about an arrangement, and we can't do it. And nobody call us a haven of fugitives. Everybody say, we are a booming city. They should come and invest. <laughs> What's going on? Well, I think because of that, what you mentioned, uh, when the police cracked down so hard on the extradition protests on Wednesday, June 12th, I think that really shocked a lot of people in Hong Kong and helped contribute to the two million strong protests, the march that happened that Sunday. Yes, exactly. And, and, and the police, I mean, their behavior mm -hmm. was really terrible. And the thing is, and they did not wear their badge and no number. And also they were wearing all the gear that you mm. could not recognize them. And some people were saying, oh, they actually don't look like Hong Kong policemen. Mm -hmm. They may be China national security. Mm -hmm. Well, who knows? But people are very, very suspicious mm -hmm. and they are very, very angry. So they just suspect all kinds of things. And it was terrible because in the past, okay, maybe during the umbrella occupation, relations between the police and especially young people was a tense. Mm -hmm. But by and large, it's okay, the relations. Now, having seen them beating people up like that and then going to hospitals to arrest patients and all these things make people very angry. That's why we are demanding an independent inquiry and to make sure it is a fair and just investigation we hope that it would be chaired by a very eminent judge and but the government still refuse mm -hmm. why do you think the extradition bill protests have been so intense ah many people have said the administration particularly Carrie Lam mm -hmm. have underestimated the Hong Kong people's fear mm. of the Communist Party because this thing goes to the heart mm. and they fear that if it, the bills pass, one day they themselves or their friends or relatives could be sent to China. And why is it so terrible to be sent to China? Because over there is complete lawlessness. Here, under the British tradition, we have the rule of law. We have an independent judiciary. People are presumed innocent until they are found guilty. Uh, defendants would not be tortured. All these things are non-existent over there. So the people are very fearful. But Kerry Lam obviously did not sense that. But why? Nah. If you look at the time when she became chief executive two years ago, she 
went through several different difficult things, very difficult, like disqualifying legislators, mm -hmm. disqualifying candidates for election from the pro-democracy camp. And then the Beijing National People's Congress Standing Committee issued an interpretation of the basic law mm -hmm. to justify those things. And then she passed, make Lechko pass a bill on co-location that is co-locating the immigration and uh, customs authorities, both of China and Hong Kong, just mm -hmm. over there, next to the Star Ferry, which we think is in breach of the joint declaration. Mm -hmm. But all these things went past, and it seems not too many people bat an eyelid. Mm -hmm. When I travel overseas, people say, hey, how come all these things happen? Hong Kong people seem to, uh, you know, <laughs> just took it. And so, <laughs> I guess in the words of the Bible, she thinks she could walk on water. Mm. So this time around, she said, Jesus, nothing. Look at all the things I have, you know, conquered. Mm -hmm. And she thought this would be the same. But this time, she got it terribly wrong. Well, let me challenge you on, on how you said China has is lawless. Uh, their courts have a 99.9% <laughs> conviction rate. I mean, that's, that's law right there. <laughs> that, that, that is law, but it's not the legal system as we know it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I speak with a little bit of authority, mm -hmm. although I'm not a lawyer, mm -hmm. but I am sitting on the board of directors of the China Human Rights Lawyers Concern Group. Mm -hmm. We set up the group here 11 years ago to offer support to the human rights lawyers in mainland China, who are very brave. Some of them are in jail, mm -hmm. being tortured, and some have disappeared, but they still carry on. And they, if they have a chance, sometimes they don't, if they have a chance to come here to meet with us, they would tell us how terrible it is. Some of them cannot practice. Mm -hmm. It's been taken away, the license. And, uh, you know, and they cannot argue for their client in court. And so it's really terrible. And they may say, I think the Chinese judicial system looks excellent on paper. But in practice, it's something else. And, and that's why even ordinary Chinese people know, because they have relatives and friends over there, and they know. And who are the people who are most fearful? It's the business people. Mm. They, and some have said it publicly. They say, if you do business in China, you have to pay bribes. So under this bill, they are all guilty. And you mm. don't know which day they will be nominated <laughs> as uh, targets for extradition. So they are very fearful. Mm -hmm. Well, I can see why the people of Hong Kong would be very concerned about this extradition bill. But do you think meaningful reform can happen in Hong Kong as long as the Chinese Communist Party is the ultimate power broker? Well, now, since 1997, because we were handed over to Chinese rule in 97, I think for the, uh, for the initial 10 years, things seem okay. Although we have no democracy, we still don't have it. But we have the rule of law. We, have, we enjoy freedoms, civil liberties, and personal safety. These are things which are very close to the Hong Kong people's heart. Not democracy. We don't even know what a democratic Hong Kong is like. But these freedoms, personal safety, are very close to our hearts. So. Our institutions, they may not be perfect, but they ensure that we enjoy these things, which are our core values. And I'm sure they are core values of people in many countries. And ironically, the level of freedoms and personal safety and the rule of law we enjoy here is much higher than that of many democratic countries. If you look around Asia, or elsewhere, you can count till your face turn blue. There are many countries which have periodic elections, but their people certainly do not enjoy the level of personal safety and freedoms and the rule of law, independence of the judiciary that we enjoy. So we want to, we cherish what we've got. We want to reform it, make it better. But, uh, and we know China can come down on us like a ton of bricks. But as I told many people in the last two weeks, Hong Kong is not Tiananmen Square. Mm. Just on June 4th this year, we had a celebration, not celebration, commemoration mm. of the massacre 30 years ago. 
And we had, what, about 150,000 people turning up to the candlelight vigil at Victoria Park, which is the starting point for the big marches. So, I think um, China can do it. The People's Liberation Army is just there. Yeah. That used to be the British barracks. So, the tanks, the machine guns, everything are there. Mm -hmm. But will they deploy them on us? And if they did, it would be at a very high price. And not, not just for us. You should also remember many Chinese rich people and their mm. children uh, have invested a lot here. That's why some people say to me, actually, this fight over the bill is a fight between former President Jiang Zemin and current President Xi Jinping, because Jiang Zemin has a lot of business interests, mm -hmm. his friends and relatives. And this bill, of course, goes to the heart of those people. And the Chinese government have also said publicly that we need this bill because there are close to 300 fugitives mm -hmm. from the mainland who have come here, who are, who are hiding here. And I can tell you, most of them are staying at the Four Seasons Hotel <laughs> over there. <laughs> They abducted one businessman from there a few months ago. Mm -hmm. That guy did not file a report with the police. So they have people here. But if the two communist leaders mm -hmm. are at loggerhead, they are fighting it out, it's very sad that we are just caught in the middle. But Hong Kong as it is, we will always be like that. But I say, if they try to destroy us, the price is very high. Not just for us, but for them too. And now we are caught in between the, the war between President Trump and President Xi. And again, because America has a lot of interest here. They have many people living here, working here, many companies are here. So they have a stake. And of course they should speak out. Well, I know we've certainly covered on our show uh, the battle between Xi, Xi Jinping and Jiang Zemin. So I hope people will check out those episodes. What do you think other countries like the U.S. can do about the situation in Hong Kong? Well, I certainly, now because Hong Kong is very much dependent on the US, because many of our business people, they trade with the US, mm -hmm. they think the US is a very important market for mm -hmm. Hong Kong, and it's no secret. And of course, there is the US Hong Kong Policy Act, mm -hmm. which was enacted before 97 to give Hong Kong special treatment especially the bit on us being an independent customs territory. Mm -hmm. And some people say, oh, well, if Hong Kong uh, loses one country, two systems, then maybe uh, the bill should be amended. And we take away that uh, independent customs territory. And the leader of the Liberal Party here, Felix Chong, said, well, he said, if that should happen, the game is over. He said, mm -hmm. <laughs> he said the game is over, not just for the business community, but for the whole of Hong Kong. And we certainly don't want that sort of uh, catastrophic thing to happen to us. But some Americans and others are suggesting maybe we should have a law, uh, you know, targeting those people who try to undermine human rights and the rule of law in Hong Kong, uh, particularly senior government officials mm -hmm. who perpetrate such acts so that they would be banned from entering the United States mm -hmm. and their assets in the United States would be frozen. And I say that is tremendous. I think that's great. Sort of like the, Magin the Magnitsky Act. Yeah, maybe something like that. So you only target the guilty individuals mm -hmm. and not harm all the other Hong Kong people because we are friends with the Americans. They don't want to harm us, but so there are certain individuals who have done such evil acts, so they should be targeted. What about the upcoming G20? Well, we certainly hope that not just President Trump, but the other leaders attending the summit would also use the occasion to voice their concern and voice their support for Hong Kong. I notice many have already spoken out. And you know, uh, a few days ago, over there in Western is the Central Government Liaison Office, mm -hmm. which is the representative of Beijing here. And they summoned many of the pro-Beijing politicians there to give them a lecture and to tell them to support Carrie Lam and say Beijing supports Carrie. And afterwards, one of them came out, Mr. Tam, and he told the media, you know, uh, they, 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 they told us to support Kerry, and they say the bill was okay, except then there was foreign interference. And they said in the last few days, 
there were 67 statements issued by foreign governments. I said, what? Big deal. If you don't care about them, even if it's 670 statements, what the hell? It's not 67 bombs. Now, the fact they counted it so closely shows they care. Mm. And that's what the human rights lawyers told us when, they, when we met. They say, don't believe it if someone tells you China doesn't care about international public opinion. Mm. It's not true. I said, really? He said, yes, China does care. Why? Because China cares about face. Mm. So 67 statements. To me, that's not enough. I want a lot more. I hope they will be issued before the G summit or during the <laughs> summit in Osaka. And of course, when they meet President Xi Jinping, I hope they will raise it too. Tell President Xi that Hong Kong people don't want the extradition bill. They don't want erosion of civil liberties and the rule of law. And we want to have their democratic government. We want to have the ability to elect our government. We're not fighting for independence. We're not fighting for self-determination. We know we are part of the People's Republic of China, but China has made a promise of one country, two systems. China's now negating on it, and we are very, very angry. Well, in 1984, I know you, you asked Margaret Thatcher if it was morally defensible to hand a city of five mil, over five million people to a communist dictatorship. Do you think the UK has upheld its side of the Sino-British Joint Declaration? UK is terrible, really. UK is always looking after its own interests, like the question I asked Mrs. Thatcher. They want money, they want trade and all that. And it's very sad. When they pulled out of Hong Kong, Hong Kong had no democratic institutions. And, uh, and they, they left nothing behind. And when they pulled out, there were over three million British citizens, but citizens who have no right to live in the UK. They created a form of citizenship called British National Overseas, the BNO, which they cannot pass on to their children, but they can use it uh, during their lifetime as some form of travel document. So whenever I meet British officials, I said, do you know what BNO stands for? It's Britain says no. Hmm. But whether you like it or not, there are still several million British citizens here. And many of them are very angry and very frightened. So Britain has a responsibility towards these people and the rest of us too, because you ran this colony for one and a half centuries. And now the people here are very, very fearful. So what the least Britain can do is to speak up. I know Brexit, Brexit is a big problem, but still not only them, but parliament, the British people should look at Hong Kong and say, hey, can we not do something for Hong Kong people? Speak out, tell the Chinese to stop cracking down on them, you know, respect one country, two systems. And Britain should talk to its allies, if it still has some, some I hope it does. Tell the allies to speak out too, because international public opinion does matter. Mm -hmm. I can see why some people call you Hong Kong's Iron Lady. Oh. <laughs> so what's next for the future of Hong Kong? No, I think we will just keep, keep on fighting, you know. Although I stepped down from the Legislative Council mm. after serving for 25 years, but I have said I will never step down from the fight for human rights, democracy and the rule of law. And we will continue to have marches, but we will do it in a peaceful and orderly way. And the next one is on the 1st of July. I hope you'll be around to see it. We will. And I tell you, like a bad penny, we will keep turning up. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.